please welcome Diana Sorensen, director of the Observatory of the Spanish Language and Hispanic Culture in the United States. Uh, Diana, please. Welcome everybody, and I'm speaking English because I know Lorja is going to do the same, and so it's less jarring. Uh, it's wonderful to see so many familiar and so many new faces, and I'm very, very happy to welcome all of you who come from near and from afar. Uh, this is a great occasion to think about the research, current research in Hispanic cultures, plural, and um, it's the third year that this takes place here at the Observatorio. Gracias, Luis. I don't think you, the microphone seems to be on. Uh, so thank you. I'm sorry I haven't spoken loudly enough. Is this better? Ahora sí. So, um, as I said, it's the third year, and it's a very, very productive session. Uh, now we have the great pleasure of hearing, uh, as she just told me, work in progress by Professor Lorgia Garcia Peña, who's the Roy Klaus Associate Professor of Romance, Languages, and Literatures, and of History and Literature, and of American <laughs> Studies. Uh, Lorgia's first walk, book has made an extraordinary splash in her field. It's entitled Translating no, the Borders of, the borders of Dominicanidad, Race, Nations, and Archives of Contradictions. It came out uh, in Duke University Press in 2016. And it's won numerous awards. What we'll hear today is part of a fascinating new project that, tell me if this is right, Lorja, you're tentatively calling translating blackness, migrations, and detours of Latinx colonialities in global perspectives. So please join me in welcoming Professor Garcia Peña. Gracias, Diana, for the lovely introduction, and thanks everyone for coming at this end of the semester in which I am surprised we still have brain power, or <laughs> we're about to test that. So, all right. During November 2012, more than two million people, two million Dominicans living in a dozen cities across the globe took to the streets to peacefully protest a series of austerity measures imposed by the newly elected president, Danilo Medina. And this is, I don't know if you can see with the light, but this is one of the, one of the protests. Residing in the US South at the time, away from any Dominican enclave, and I could not help but glue myself to Facebook and Twitter in the hopes of participating, even if virtually, in what many believed to be the beginning of the quote unquote Dominican spring. The transnational, youth-led peaceful revolution that was sure to bring about all the changes Dominicans, particularly those of us in the diaspora, had been dreaming of our entire lives. But just as other social movements of the decade, Dreamers, Occupy, the Arab Spring, the Dominican peaceful revolution came to a stagnant halt after a few months of intensity, partly due to the silencing and repression imposed by the Dominican state. In my effort to stay connected to what seemed like the most exciting event in, my, in the history of my generation, I looked at every single photograph, listened to speeches, and come through all minimally relevant news articles that circulated on the web. It was in this laborious obsession that I came across one picture that was disseminated briefly on Facebook around Thanksgiving 2012. 
the photo show a man of deep brown complexion, and I can't show you the photo because I still don't have permission for it, but here it is. Moreno Claro, he would be called in the Dominican Republic, holding a sign that read, Obama, no nos ignores, nosotros también somos negros. The photo was taken in Milan during one of the smallest and less publicized of the many marches and protests that took place during the short-lived Dominican Spring. For days after seeing it, I was troubled by the message on the photo. Why did this man, presumably a Dominican immigrant residing in Italy, write a slogan mentioning Obama to protest Dominican state exploitation of the working people? And what, I asked myself, did race have to do with the protest? One of the most intriguing particularities of the photograph is the language of the slogan. The posters uses Spanish adjective, adjective negro or black, which in the Dominican Republic is more often used to describe objects than people, over the Dominican vernacular prieto or moreno, commonly employed to describe a person's skin color. A poster that read, Obama somos prietos, though carrying the same semantic meaning, would not resonate outside the Dominican community. Farther, a poster that read Somos Prietos would be dissonant within a Dominican community precisely, precisely because black or prieto does not exist as an ethnically or socially differentiated category in the Dominican Republic. A more likely statement would have been Somos Pobres or Somos Immigrantes. Yet the black Italian, and I'm using black in quotation, Dominican protester understood the political capital of blackness in the diaspora. He also understood the need to translate the struggles of oppression of a Dominican Prieto worker, an immigrant, into a lingua franca that would allow him to establish a dialogue with his host nation, Italy, as well as with the rest of the cyber world. That is, the man understood black as a product of the United States empire. So that to be black in the world, that is, to have access to the discourse of political descent and historical belonging that can result in one's positionality as an interlocutor of power and history, it is necessary to enter blackness as theorized and mediated by the US empire. The dynamics at play in the man's translation of his position as a poor Dominican immigrant Prieto in Milan into a black man in the world are foundational to the questions my project seeks to answer. Is there a way to stop this from moving on its own? <laughs> <laughs> I really would like to keep it as I go. So my intervention today is part of a new book project, as, as Diana mentioned. I have tentatively entitled Translating Blackness, the Viven and Detours of Latinx Colonialities in Global Perspective, which is concerned with how notions of race and citizenship have shaped the ways in which minoritized subjects negotiate their racial identity and belonging in the diaspora. Specifically, my research grapples with the multiple ways in which Latin American migrants and Lat Latinx people of African descent translate racial meaning across national contexts in order to survive racism and to find a space of belonging and representation within the nations that often exclude them. The book engages various national spaces in Latin America, the Dominican Republic, Chile, and Ecuador, in the United, the United States, and in Europe, Spain, Italy, and Holland, providing a new cartography for understanding Latin American and Latinx blackness in the 21st century. Theoretically, I trace how language and bodies intersect on various geographical spaces to produce, translate, and context meaning. The transnational and transatlantic triangulation of black Latinidad that I propose hopes to explain the implications of tracing of race and more specifically of blackness as a social construct on the everyday life of people while tracing how the social construction of race is a project of nations as well as of the communities that define it. People confronting these meanings ultimately find ways to belong, engaging terms like black and ideologies in the particular everyday life realities. One of the concerns I have is on the impact that movements of US-mediated concept of race, black, and ethnicity, Latino, 
have had on the experiences of Afro-Latin Americans and their descendants in different geographical spaces. For the section that I'm presenting today and focusing on black Dominicanidad as a case example that help us trace the genealogy of Afro-Latinidad beginning with the US political interventions on Hispaniola, both Haiti and the Dominican Republic after the 1865 Civil War, which resulted in the attempt to purchase and annex Haiti and the Dominican Republic to the United States, the resettlement of African American colonies on the island, the political military intervention of US and Hispaniola, which also had lasting results in the relationship between the two nations sharing the island, the state of Afro-Caribbean religious groups, and the overall politics of the nation, and of course, the massive immigration of Dominicans and Haitians to the United States and now to Europe. The book thus first historicizes what I call the biban of blackness, looking at how Latino racialization was from the birth of the nation a process of negotiation with the US, with the US empire. And the second half of the book looks at how 21st century um, so how in the 21st century cultural and intellectual dominance of the United States is producing new ethnicities that are very much linked to the questions of migration, capital, and the role of media in imagining transnational communities. Or I like to synthesize it as I start with Frederick Douglass and I end with Cardi B, more or less. <laughs> so my overall analysis proposes Dominican blackness as a theory that travels between European colonial legacy United States imperial expansion over the Caribbean, and the present state of migration and transnational exchanges that arise over the empirical realities of Dominican blackness. Um, this project is very, very interdisciplinary. It includes the analysis of historical documents, literary texts, films, performances, photographs um, in places like Milan, Amsterdam, Santiago de Chile, Santo Domingo, and New York. So I can talk a little bit more about the context, but for Today's presentation, I want to show a little uh, excerpt from a chapter that I'm calling Being Black Ain't So Bad. And it starts with something like this. Okay. A black girl cannot be Miss Italia. It is not in the rules. Where the words that began the scandal surrounding the 1996 crowning of Denny Mendes as the first black Miss Italia during the 50th celebration of the annual beauty context. The rules that alluded by Alba Parietti, a judge in a Miss Italia pageant and the former holder of the title herself, shed light on the anxiety that the question of race and multi-ethnicity produced among many Italians at the closing of the 20th century, as the nation struggled with becoming the recipient rather than the sender of migrants. Denny Mendes, an 18-year-old naturalized Italian citizen from the Dominican Republic was, quote unquote, a beautiful girl in the eyes of photographer George, uh, and judge Bob Krieger. But she simply was not, and I quote again, an adequate representative of the Italian nation. Mendes' inadequacy was explained not in racial, but in cultural terms, a practice that as Heather Miller argues, has allowed Italy to justify racism under the veil of difference that postulate different groups and identities. Mendes won, though, and was crowned and went on to represent Italy in front of the world. So why and how did Mendes win? And more importantly, what consequences did her victory have for the Italian nation and specifically for its new citizens of color? Mendes' coronation, I would argue, allowed for the growth of a public dialogue regarding an Italy that needed to be more inclusive of its new citizens of color because, as Sofia Fora Mensa argues, the national beauty queen can serve as a unique and exceptional repository for ideals of citizenship and national identity, where notions of race, class, and gender can be negotiated or at the very least imagined. The beauty queen's victory therefore crowned the public debate that emerged in the 1980s regarding the immigrants' place within the Italian nation, particularly after a series of hate crimes dismantled the country's national narrative that had per perpetuated a myth of Italy as an inclusive society that embraced multiculturalism and lived, quote unquote, beyond race. 
it was now clear that the face of Italy could be an other, despite the protests and concerns of Parietti and Krieger. Debates surrounding the consequences of the 1996 Miss Italia pageant on the Italian nation have continued as the Mediterranean country becomes more concerned with its role as an immigrant receiving nation. However, a question that has yet to be explored is the, important, the importance that Dennis, Denis Mendez's victory had on Dominicans residing in Italy and elsewhere. Of particular concern is the significance of Denis Mendez's international portrayal as black, a label rarely used in the Dominican Republic to de describe a person of Mendez's light brown complexion. The use and embracing of Mendez's quote unquote blackness and more importantly, the deployment of the label black as an international category representing a common experience is intriguing, particularly in the context of Dominican racial imagination, through which Mendes has become both black and other than black. The beauty queen's story could be read as a significant example of Dominican, of what I call Dominican contradiction. The term contradictions, as I have defined it as elsewhere, refers to the complex social political processes that have shaped the ways, the various attempts to narrate Dominicanness or Dominicanidad. I argue that contradiction finds its origins in the narratives of intellectuals of the mid 19th century who struggle with their desire for freedom, their imagined mestizaje, and the need to insert the nation in the modern world by gaining recognition from the imperial and colonial powers. Contradiction, however, takes various forms throughout the 20th and 21st centuries as other narrations of Dominicanidad emerge, particularly in the diaspora, destabilizing the national and official narrative. Dominican racial and ethnic representation of blackness in Italy are part of the contradictions of Dominican identity that allow citizens to simul simultaneously navigate multiple racial systems. The victory of Denny Mendes and the scandal that followed created a lively debate among Dominicans on the island, particularly among women who were confronted with the contradiction of racial identity. Local newspapers such as El Nacional and Destin Diario published a series of articles and caricatures that went from intense pride over the victory of the Dominicana ausente to ridiculing the idea of Mendes blackness. The reactions from individuals were also varied. Some believed that Mendes was, and I quote, a pretty India, not black, and that Italians were simply being racist or silly by using the term to define her. Others thought that Mendes' victory represented a victory for all Dominican women everywhere, because as one woman, Ramona, explained to me, and I quote, Dominicanas have been going to the U.S. for a much longer period of time, yet you do not see a Miss USA from the Dominican Republic. There is a Miss Universe but not a Miss USA. The Miss Universe my interviewee referred to was Amelia Vega, a white Dominican from Santiago, who many regarded as being the adequate representative of the nation. When asked what made Vega such a good representative of Dominicanidad as opposed to Mendes, for instance, another interviewee, Mariana, explained to me that Vega's coronation was appropriate because, and I quote, you don't want them foreigners thinking this is a country of blacks, like Haiti. Everyone always thinks Dominicans are all black, but actually we come in all different shades, like Indias, Morenas, Rubias. I mean, look at me, I'm not black, yet I am a true one, the pura cepa. <laughs> and quote. The previously cited reactions to Mendes' coronation highlight the contradiction of Dominicanidad that allows for definitions such as India to substitute for black and mulatto. In addition, they bring attention, as seen in Ramona's reaction, to the role of US in defining Dominican identity, particularly in the context of Dominican representation in the US diaspora, while shedding light on the question of aesthetic and national representation of women that insists on perpetuating European notions of beauty as symbols of the national body. Both women's reactions express concern with the foreign view of Dominicanidad. For Ramona, Mendes' victory was a good thing. She felt validated and appreciated because, and I quote, Denny is like one of us, you know? She could be like my niece. Mariana, on the other hand, seemed to be more concerned with the idea that foreigners can only imagine Dominicans as black. 
simplifying Dominican racial diversity into a Eurocentric case, black-white racial binary. Harmonas and Mariana's comments illuminate the central question of racial identity in the Dominican Republic, particularly as, concerned, as it concerns the everyday life of its citizens. From their reactions, we can conclude that both women understood Sorry, I forgot about my slides, so I'm not trying to ignore you. <laughs> Understood um, that racial identity in the Dominican Republic is a complicated matter, and that Dominicans are aware that foreigners, be it scholars or beauty pageant judges, cannot understand Dominican race, <coughs> or for that matter, all labels for Dominican blackness. So in order to better understand this complex dynamic, please allow me a brief historical digression, or what I call the two-minute course crash on Dominican blackness. There we go. The Dominican Republic obtained its independence from Haiti, not from Spain, in 1844. The process of shaping the national imagination that followed independence was grounded on the elite-driven idea of a Dominican nation that was mixed race, yet other than black, in order to mark a clear difference from the neighboring Haiti which was imagined as a black nation. Now, if you know anything about Haitian history, the Haitian Constitution of 1804 declared we're all black. And the entire world hated Haiti for it. So if you are sharing an island with Haiti and you want to be recognized as a nation, well, you have to be something other than Haiti. The myth of the hybrid non-black nation was ultimately corroborated by the United States imperial imagination. In 1871, for instance, the US Senate Commission of Inquiry who went to the Dominican Republic to assess its ability for self-government, and ojo, that commission included Frederick Douglass, found people to be, and I quote, generally of mixed blood, with great majority being neither purely black nor purely white. The United States approval of Dominican Republic as quote unquote, other than black, added to the complexity of how the country was imagined and perceived by its inhabitants and the outside world. Meanwhile, it granted power and authority to the dominant narrative of hybridity put in motion by the liberal elites, ultimately condemning Afro-Dominicans to obscurity and marginalization. In order to explain color diversity and hybridity, the white elites resorted to claims of mestizo, indio, identity that was only useful because the quote unquote ethnic element, that is the native population, was no longer present. The hybridity discord gave way to a narrative of indigenismo, which was disseminated among the population for over a century. This narrative of indigenismo, which was um, created an idea of cultural miscegenation that substituted the living Afro-Dominican heritage with the spirit of a decimated indigenous race. This rhetoric provided a series of advantages for legitimating elite version of history. First. Being part Indian provided a way of claiming genuine ties to the land and therefore securing a history prior to colonization, while maintaining a link to the colonial power through the Spanish counterpart, counterpart implicit in the racial mix. Secondly, the indigenous claims con uh, connected them ideologically and political to other Latin American independent movements, locating the Dominican Republic within a much larger enterprise. Finally, it allowed for the desired erasure of African roots from the official narrative of the Dominican nation through their substitution with the indigenous heritage. Thus, when Mendes and India in the Dominican racial imaginary was named, quote unquote, the first black woman to represent the Italian nation 150 years after Dominican independence from Haiti, confusion, disapproval, and disbelief overwhelmed the Dominican public opinion, as well as people attempted to understand the meaning of the label. But for Dominican women immigrants in Italy, the label was no surprise. In fact, it is how they had come to understand themselves in the new nation, because as Belisa Ramirez, a domestic worker in Tuscany, explained to me, and I quote, that is how they see us, how they Italian see us. It is where we belong, and that's okay. Because being black here ain't such a bad thing. At least it means we have a place, a name, you know? At least here I am a black woman rather than no one at all. As in the Dominican Republic, the terms that define blackness in Italy, negra, nera, di colore, 
are part of a complex process of contradiction which are linked to the internal, as in the separation of northern and southern Italy, as well as the external histories of nation narration and public interpolation. Recent immigrants like Ramirez thus occupied an interstitial position in Italy. As Silvia Pariati has argued, the country is constantly changing as Italy's subalterns find ways to talk back, reclaiming the possibility of a plurality in cultural representation that could finally challenge the long protected image of Italy as a white Catholic nation. Much work has been done to shed light on the north and southern dynamic of Italy, particularly as related to race and class. It is helpful though, to remember how when thinking about the racialization of migrants in Italy, the coloring of the Italian South is also an element present in the racial imagination. Now the first immigrant women to arrive in Italy in the 60s and 70s came from Eritrea, Cape Verde, and the Philippines to work for the most part in the homes of Italian families. Their migration was often facilitated by connections with the Catholic organizations as a direct result of Italy colonial's past. Italy is not usually imagined as a colonial power, however, mainly because it did not exist as a modern nation until 1861. But the Italian Empire did join other European nations in establishing colonies overseas, an enterprise that continued into the 20th century. By 1914, for instance, Italian, Italy has annexed Eritrea, Somalia, and Libya. Miro argues that in setting questions of migration and racialization, we need to remember that although Italy has not been historically marked as a colonial power, it does form part of the greater colonial expansion of the 15th century, which in turn influenced its constructions of race, identity, discourses, and practices. There is not much scholarship on the specificity of Dominican migration to Italy. The little that has been documented, mostly through informal interviews and statistical data, shows that it has been a network migration of mostly women, the majority from small towns in the borderland southwest part of the Dominican Republic. Unlike other Latin American women, Dominicans found themselves, however, with the ability to participate in both black and Latin American organizations. Therefore, inhabiting somewhat privileged space, space within their own marginality. Much like the, the experience of Dominicans in Washington DC during the 1940s that Geneta Candelario studies, Dominican migrants in Italy discovered that they were often read as black, but their ability to speak Spanish, which also facilitated their learning of Italian language, could set them apart, if desired, from Africans. This contradiction made it so that Dominican migrants could be racialized as black, in a US or European context, while at the same time marked as different through language and cultural identities. This experience allowed Dominicanas in Italy to quickly form links and alliances with, within various communities gaining as Mercedes Frias, a Dominican nationalized citizen who was elected to the Italian parliament in 2006, recounts, and I quote, access to a larger form of sisterhood than the one we had back home. But being black for Dominican women meant more than a certain space of belonging. It also meant that their bodies could be physically marked as sites of consumption, corruption, and exotism. The story of Lucy Alcantara illustrates this point. Let's see if I can get, here we go. Lucy left her native town of Hakimeyas at the age of 22, leaving behind two sons, ages six and three, in the care of her mother. I came here, she remembers, through a contrata, a work contract to care for an elderly lady. The first year, Lucy made very little money because she was expected to pay for her living expenses and pay taxes to the Italian state in addition to her home nation. I barely had enough money to survive as I had to send back money for my kids and it simply was not enough. The people worked for were really abusive. They made me do all kinds of chores that were not in my contract and whenever I complained, they threatened to send me back. I was pretty back then, and Italian men were always looking at me and touching me in the streets. So one day I was like, enough. I found me a job as a dancer, and it was there that I met Carlo, and the rest is history. And a quote. Lucy worked as an exotic dancer and occasionally, quote unquote, took clients home. Along with her, the rest of the dancers and sex workers were all from, the, from her home country, from Nigeria, or from Peru. 
A few of them had been sex workers in the island, but the majority, like Lucy, had come to Italy to work as maids and change careers when confronted with the harshness of everyday life, reality of domestic work. Domestic work is one of the largest sectors driving international female labor migration. In Spain, for, his, for instance, approximately 50% of annual immigrant quotas are allocated for dom domestic works. Domestic work worldwide is an unregulated sector of the market as no labor laws or standards exist. Lucy, like many domestic workers, end up running two households, her employers as well as her own from afar. The economic pressure and the impossibility of mobility as domestic work does not allow for more than meager raises made it so that Lucy's only possibility for a higher paying job was within the sex industry. And I quote, I was not a loose woman, una mujer alegre, back home. And if my mother ever knew what I did here, she would just die. But I had to do what I had to do for my family, you know? And I feel lucky, blessed, that I could get out of that horrible job, that I was able to make money otherwise, and more importantly, that I found me a man who took me out of that life and made me his wife, very lucky. By the first wave, of Dominican female migration to Italy in the 1980s, the Dominican Republic had already become an important site of commercial sex, especially for European tourists. As early as 1920, travel narratives, ads, and rumors of Dominicana's hypersexuality circulated in Europe and the United States. The Dominican Republic and other Caribbean nations have thoughts being imagined as sexcapes, to borrow from Denise Brennan, as a location for commercialized sexual exchange between white tourists and locals. But by the same token, Dominican subjects have been imagined as sexually available and sexually proficient commodities for the enjoyment and consumption of Europeans and North Americans. The Dominican immigrant woman in Italy can embody the complex dynamics of the sexcape, being perceived as both a fantasy and a threat by the receiving nation. This reality means that by the time Denny Mendes, by the time of Denny Mendes' victory, Italians were accustomed to equating blackness and immigrant with sex or labor, a process that encapsulated the Dominican immigrant woman within a limited marginal space of consumption. The public resistance of the pageant judges, as well as the opinion of many Italians, reflected a keen understanding of the global and transnational economy of inequalities that made Mendes, quote unquote, inadequate to represent Italy. The color of her skin meant more than a simple deviation from aesthetics of Italian beauty. Mendes' phenotype meant that Italy could be represented by the marginal, the poor, the prostitute, ooh, the foreigner, and the object of fear and desire. In short, by those who should remain outside the nation. This possibility challenged the very nature of the beauty pageant in which virginity, purity and innocence are presumed to be important quality of the miss representation of the nation. Or, as Afori Mensa reminds us, and I quote, in the United States and other English speaking countries, the word miss in the beauty pageant's name functions as a reminder that she's supposed to be unmarried and therefore virginal, young and therefore pliable, a clean slate onto whose body can be mapped ideals of femininity and nationhood." End of quote. If blackness and Dominicanness meant sex or labor within the Italian nation, and the beauty queen must be virginal and poor and pure, Mendes's victory thus came to challenge not only the image of the immigrant body, but also the very contradictory structures of national representations as embodied in the Miss Italian beauty pageant. The fact that Mendes could later represent Italy in the universe, in Miss Universe pageant meant that Italy could, would have to answer Buck Krieger, Krieger's question of what does she, Mendes, have to do with Italy in the eyes of the world, being forced to confront Italians' role as colonizers and dominant in the global economic inequality. But the fact that Mendes won via television vote also suggests that a, immigrant women had significant cultural power within Italian society, and that many Italians thought it important to challenge this limited representation of the nation in order to diversify the traditional definition of Italianness. 
Mendes' coronation is therefore a symbolic victory of immigrant women in Italy that allowed for a window of cultural representation that arguably cha changed what the face of who could belong looks like. And I have a little anecdote. I'm, I've been doing um, research in Italy for five years now, and the icebreaker for me is like, do you remember when Danny Mendes was, uh, became Miss Italia? And every single black woman I've interviewed of any ethnicity has a long story. Oh yeah, I was sitting here and there. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's a really nice icebreaker. The 2006 victory of uh, Mercedes Frias, another black Dominican naturalized citizen, as representative of the Italian parliament, further advanced this goal by taking that which was symbolic into the political realm, therefore transforming cultural representation into political action. Mendes might have not been the adequate representative of the nation Italians were accustomed to, but she was the face of an other Italy, one inhabited by the migrants, the southerners, the marginal, or the majority. So to conclude, let us return to the image of the man in Milan, and if you remember this dude. Here we go. And to my orig original question, what does race have to do with the austerity measures and taxation of working people in 2012? The study of race has dominated the bulk of academic work about Dominicans at home and in the diaspora. US and European scholarship has focused largely, largely on border relations, anti-Haitian discourse, and on what some regard as Dominican quote unquote black denial, which is often just opposed with a presumed Haitian embracing of blackness. On the other hand, contemporary Dominican and Dominican-American scholarship has focused on the significance of diasporic intellectual, cultural, and political interventions on the island politics on race and gender. One could say that dia diasporic intellectuals and cultural producers have been seeking to deconstruct the colonial imagination that informed the divisions of Haiti and the Dominican Republic in the 19th century and that influenced in the racist discourse dominating 20th 20th and 21st century Dominican political ideology. In what is now a famous quote, historian Frank Moya Pons argued that in the United States, Dominicans quote unquote, realized they're black. Critiquing the provocative idea, Silvia Torres Sayans argues that Dominicans in the United States are confronted with new forms of racism and are therefore forced to make ethnic alliances with other racialized minorities. So I, so I find Moya Pons' analysis simplistic. I would concede that in the diaspora, Dominicans are indeed confronted with a different type of discrimination than the one that they faced at home. In the United States, it's not just class, for instance, but also skin tone, hair texture, accent, education level, level of cultural assimilation, ability to participate in the purchase of cultural commodities that defines one's race. Thus, in the diaspora, confronted with US racialization that is very much linked to the open mood of slavery and Jim Crow as foundational experience of the American nation, diaspora and Dominicans find that blackness provides a language for confronting their new place in their host nation while interpolating the historical oppression back home. It is not then that Dominicans quote unquote find out they're black when they migrate, as Moya Pons suggests but rather that in the diaspora, Dominicans find a political language from which to articulate their own experience of racialization, oppression, disenfranchisement, and silencing, a process that allows them to build alliances and with other oppressed communities around the world. Race scholar Blas Jimenez in his book, Afro Dominicano por Elección, Negro por Nacimiento, calls for the literal translation of Dominicanidad to the international recognizable label black and for the embracing of the prefix Afro as a strategy to dialogue with the common histories that have engendered black experience in the Americas. Almost as if responding to Jimenez's call to action, the slogan, Nosotros Tambien Somos Negros, chosen by the, ma the man in Milan, serves as a signifier from which to theorize and historicize Dominicanidad in terms that could be understood validated and accepted by a large transnational audience. Further, it locates the Dominican experience in relation to the United States, serving as a reminder of the two nations in, in intricate histories of unequal relationship. Following the previous reasoning, we could argue that the man in Milan understood that the adjective negro, black, 
possessed a certain transnational value that the ethnic identification Dominican or the Spanish semantic translations Prieto or Moreno did not. The man in Milan recognized Negro to be a powerful artifact for political contestation, as well as a global signifier of economic oppression and disenfranchisement. For most people, the, world, the word black, just like Dominicano, are equated to poor. Unlike Dominicano, however, black is historically and culturally situated in the world. Rather, one can argue that black as a cultural and political category is visible. Still, a question remains. What exactly makes someone black? Is it the color of his or her skin? Is it cultural, linguistic, and ethnic alliances? Or is it politics and legislation? The notion of race as a social construct has widely been accepted in scholarly conversations for decades now, to the extent that the phrase has become academically cliche. The meaning of race as a social construct, however, is not always clear, as the phrase does not allow for the empirical experiences of subjects negotiating racial identity in an increasingly transnational world. In other words, the construction, quote unquote, of race does not provide a solution for institutionalized racism, white supremacy, and the everyday life struggles faced by racialized people around the world. Farther, as seen in the case of Dominican blackness in Italy, the phrase does not account for the hierarchies of theories and the traveling and imposition of racial understandings that, this, that are displayed in the constructions and performances. In his engagement of blackness, the man in Milan, we could say, it, is both interpolating and contradicting Dominicanidad for the word negro, which attempts to contest oppression through a theorization of blackness that is very much contaminated with the very structure sustaining black Dominican oppression. The alternative, however, is the continuing silences of Dominican economic exploitation of the state and international corporations and the racialization of the immigrant subject as an other without history. The man in Milan, like many of us in the diaspora, has chosen blackness, hoping to find in that language uh, that language will bring the racial justice and equality the majority of Dominicans have been fighting for for centuries. Or, as Belisa explained to me, being black ain't so black, so I'll take black. Thank you. <laughs> I'm happy to take questions. If you don't mind, I'm going to sit. Oh, now it works. Okay. No, it's for the recording. Ah. Uh, thank you. It's a fascinating uh, uh, project. I've, I know you spent time doing a lot of research in Italy, and it's a pleasure to see the things you're, you're uh, discovering and interpreting. I had a simple question. The Miss Italia woman would obviously represent the beautiful sexualized woman. And then, uh, if I understood you correctly, you suggest that that had some kind of empowering move towards the woman that was elected to... Mercedes uh, Frias, Parliament. To Parliament, and I wanted you to say a little bit more about how that transition from beautiful, sexualized to able, legislating, associated with the power of the state, black women. How did that get negotiated? So it, it isn't exactly, or I wouldn't suggest that it is that the symbolic over-sexualization of a black woman's body in Italy translates into political action, but rather that the, the symbolic um, representation of the Italian nation at the, through Danny Mendes allowed for intersectional connections among black communities that were otherwise islands. In other words, she became sort of a, a location for people to meet in the street and form alliances. Um, there's been, I mean, this is 
short for the amount of, of research that I've done on it, but there's been a lot of research done on what the symbolic um, winning of Miss Italia allow in terms of construction of women organizations, particularly around Tuscany and Rome, um, where before that, people saw themselves only as ethnic groups. So Filipinos will hang out with Filipinas, and uh, Chinese will hang out with Chinese, and Eritreans with Eritreans, but all of a sudden, the, the outcry and the, the way the public shaming of, of Danny Mendez as non-belonging, sort of a, a walk, if you will, a political consciousness among particularly second generation and younger women of color at a moment uh, in which Italy was barely beginning to even think about what it means to have an ethnic minority. How many years separated the Miss Italia? Ten. Mm. Ten. So. It's very interesting so, detours that lead to. Very interesting, and and what we see now it, it's 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 changing very quickly, um, especially with the quote unquote refugee crisis and with the massive number of um, Habesha and um, Af African migrants coming into places like Milan, um, where if, if there was a, a, a short moment of celebratory acceptance even within a huge problematic uh, way, now it's, it's a lot of detachment and we're seeing a, a, a rise on uh, hate crimes, but also a rise on discriminatory policies um, made precisely to keep people like Danny Mendes from accessing citizenship. Thank so it's, you. yeah, welcome. Thank you very much for your insightful presentation. Uh, it has helped me a lot uh, in understanding uh, some statements from Dominicans that I've heard, like not being black or being black, and I was like, okay, so how are they making these boundaries? But my question for you is, I have many questions, but I guess I can only make one, right? Okay, so um, um, I'm intrigued about the idea that uh, the social construction of reality does Oh, so not what I'm thinking of. Um, of race is not uh, a tool for understanding these negotiations. Um, sociologists use it a lot to distinguish and to um, analyze boundaries uh, mm -hmm. uh, among race. So I was wondering if you could expand a little bit on this idea and how I, are you? Happy, happy to. Um, so. There's two, two thoughts behind that. Um, one is that when we, when we say social construction of race, mm -hmm. we're still privileging one social construction of race. So if we're saying that race is a social construct, we need to take into account and take seriously what each society is saying when they're talking about race. So that if we're going to say race is a social construct, I have to take it seriously when somebody in the Dominican Republic say I'm an Indio, mm -hmm. because that is their social construction of race in that society. But the way in which um, the academic language around race, sociologists, but also humanists, mm -hmm. talk about race is, is very top down. So that you are able, or someone is able, to go to the Dominican Republic and look at Dominicans as black and be confused as to why they're not using the terminology that, you use, that you're used to. So I think we need to dislodge if we're going to try to have any type of transnational conversation about race and ethnicity. We have to first start looking at how people are naming themselves, locate that historically. And, and, and understand what is the meaning behind those labels, and then we can make that sort of link and translate it into whatever academic language you're doing. Otherwise, what we're doing is we're going over there, and we're imposing how we see race, and we're completely ignoring 500 years of history in which people have been constructing their own racial ideology and naming it however they think it works for them. Right. So for the Dominican Republic, it's really interesting because uh, both in, in sort of African American studies in the US and in Latin American studies in the US, people are always shocked. They're like, oh, Dominicans don't know they're black. No, Dominicans are very aware that they're black. I don't know a single Dominican that would say I am white. Mm -hmm. But the terms that they use to name blackness are not internationally recognized. And that is shaping academic dialogue in the, in the DR. So that the only people that are able to access uh, publication, go to LASA, or talk about blackness outside of the DR are people who opt to use the terminology that we agree is correct to name Dominican blackness. And we're missing out because we're not understanding that actually the richness of this 
terms, the way, the reason why they call themselves Indio, Moreno Claro, Moreno Oscuro, is because the DR had a de facto emancipation before there was even slavery in the US. So that they came up with terms that would define their blackness as free in opposition to, let's say, um, the other colonies that Negro was used as a equal to slavery. So it actually has a rich political history of freedom, but it's read as the complete opposite and is manipulated by political um, political processes in the 20th century. So it's, it's complicated, but that, that's what I mean. If, if we're gonna take social concerts seriously, then we need to look at each society and we look at, need to look at them historically and we, then, then we can talk about how that relates to the kind of research that we're doing. Yeah, um, yeah I would love to continue this conversation with you later on, perhaps, so I don't, uh, I, I give uh, room to other people. But there are studies, I know some studies that take your position from a social construction perspective, but we will continue. Not nearly enough. Yeah. So we have, we have, there is, there is, uh, I have colleagues at Harvard that go to the DR and say, well, in the US, all these people will be black. I don't understand. Why are they not saying I'm black? And then dismissing their blackness and dismissing their struggles because they're not using the kind of language that we're used to understanding. So there's nearly not enough. Can can we can we talk privately later? I mean, I'm being recorded right now. <laughs> what a wonderful talk! Thank you so much. Um, so many fascinating angles. I am just wondering, and I think it. it pulls out a theoretical theme from what you just said about um, confronting the ways of talking about race, the language of race, the conceptualization, the construct of race in each society. So I wonder, uh, during your years of researching in Italy, whether you have um, worked with Italian constructions of Italian racial uh, identity, because mm -hmm. uh, if we go for the black and white distinction, um, there is, you know, I, I mean, Italy is probably going to fall on the side of whiteness, but the racial um, uh, makeup of the population of the Italian peninsula is extremely diverse. Uh, and I just, what I was wondering is whether the experience of increased migration of diaspora from um, uh, more um, dark-skinned uh, um, countries has erased a complex discourse about uh, Italianness before that, uh, or whether it has made that discourse more nuanced? No, I, I do, thanks for your question. I do spend quite a bit of time um, reading and, and talking to Italian scholars. Um, and there is a really long and complicated history of even even how the Italian nation came to be. It's like no one knows what Italy is. Um, and they don't. But what they're trying to do is look at the descendants of immigrants to tell them to wear the flag, wave it, and tell them what Italy is, um, while at the same time denying them Italian citizenship. So so what I think what what um, sort of the not so much the immigrants, but so the, the thing that happens in Europe is that Europeans think that race is a is an American problem. And it's an American problem only because they refuse to call the descendants of immigrants citizens. So that's, you know, so people continue to be immigrants even third and fourth generation. Um, and that's what you see in Italy, where the second and third generation are demanding citizenship and sort of trying to come up with a language of, uh, that can bring more nuance to the complexity of, of racial identity in Italy, but it's being refused. And they're, the language of such as second generation immigrant or immigrant continues to be um, used to refer to these people. Um, and even though there is a sort of a, a really complicated history between sort of the north and south divide, and that's still very visible, the, the new migrations just came to add more to that complication. And in fact, a lot of the hate crimes are happening in the south. Um, which is not surprising if we just look at how uh, borders work and how immigrants of color are received everywhere. Yeah.
Thank you, Lorja, for a wonderful presentation. It's very interesting. I was very um, struck by the, I mean, the commonalities, the um, exacerbation of um, sexualization of women of color, not just in Italy, that's just everywhere. And at the same time, the connection or their path to, to, to access to immigration via uh, domestic work. So you have this dual uh, side of these women. They are domestic workers. Then domestic work is invisible. And then at the same time, they are also, or some of them are, can also be sex workers by the same visibility, invisibility. Mm -hmm. So I was just um, curious to see how different that works for the Dominican immigrants in Italy as opposed to, for example, in Spain or here in the US with the same, um, let's say, just brown or colored women who also do domestic work and are being sexualized for that dual visibility and visibility. Thank you. So I went to Italy following these women. Um, and then the project became something else. You, you wouldn't know from, from the presentation today, but it's mostly about questions of second generation and, and, and citizenship. Um, and the dynamics are similar, uh, but just like racial construction, uh, they're shaped by local politics and legislations, um, but they're also shaped by, by um, the market of, of sexualized consumption that has sort of struck in, a streak in the Caribbean since the 90s. So Cuba and Dominican women in particular are always perceived as more sexually available. And Cuba and the Dominican Republic are, have become sort of these places where people go um, for, for that kind of uh, interaction. So when you have a migration that is almost 100% women, I mean, the majority of, of immigrants from the 80s and 90s in Italy um, were women. That's changing now, mostly with reunification law and also with second generation. The way that people have been accustomed to seeing, there is no other representation. And that is radically different from the US. We, we have the racialization of immigrants, we have a lot of racialized problems, but you cannot say that there aren't any other representations of Latinas in the media, um, in, in other spaces. Because migration to Italy is relatively new, which is what's interesting to me. Um, and because of the way in which both immigrants of color, but also Italians in general, have always sort of had an, an eye on the US. I mean, because of the links between US and Italy, it's really interesting how some of the language is being translated, but some of the politics are not. Um, and how um, that translates into sort of the everyday life experiences of these women that are either, if you, if you can perform middle class, then you're automatically read as an American tourist. If you're a black woman who can perform middle class, you're an American tourist. Otherwise, you are either a sex worker or a domestic worker. Both sectors are incredibly not regulated, and women suffer all kinds of abuses. So it's really, it's a really interesting sort of dichotomy where you cannot you cannot be a professional woman of color and be presumed to be Italian of of any generation, yeah. You, you are automatically presumed to be a black American who's visiting, you're a tourist. So that's really, and that happens to people who are born there and who, um, and who happen to be black Italians. So it's really interesting. Sorry, do you have a number for the size of the Dominican population? Yeah, it's um, so Italian uh, Dominican migration um, to Italy is, is the fastest growing. So after the, the United States is the fastest growing. There are about 75,000 Dominicans in Italy right now. Yeah, and that's documented. On docu it's a little harder to count undocumented workers. So thank you so much. Thank you, Paco. Such a wonderful talk. And uh, we're coming back at 2. Sure. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you.